Hello, this is a video interview by Willen Wij Weten. My name is Arjan Bos, and for those of you who don't know, Willen Wij Weten is a, a Dutch uh, alternative news website, which means do we want to know? And today, August the 2nd of the year 2009, we're very happy to have Bill Ryan and Kerry Cassidy of Project Camelot with us here in Amsterdam. Bill and Kerry, welcome. Thanks. And as we say in England, the boot is on the other foot now, because we're on the other side of the camera, you know. Yeah. I think this is the first time. Is this the first time someone's done, us, done a video interview of us? It, it might be. I, I don't know. I can't. If it has happened I mean, before. I we've had a lot of interviews, but actually not on video, I don't think. Not no, on video. We had radio interviews. I yeah. had some radio, radio interviews. interviews. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we've done conferences, but we haven't done a video interview with someone like yourself. I don't think. Mm -hmm. And if there's someone out there saying, well, what about mine? Then we're sorry, we, we, we can't remember it. Yeah. We yeah. can't remember and anything. I would else. really like that area covered. I would, go, I would mm. like to go into more personal detail than mm. is usual in Project Camelot videos. And also, when you're interviewed in uh, radio interviews, it's mostly about mm. uh, the subjects that you cover in the Project Camelot. That's right. And what I'm also interested in is because they, they, you put a lot out there already mm. in your personal stories. For example, uh, I listened to a radio show a couple of weeks ago, and in that you mentioned, Bill, that uh, you once had an ET girlfriend. And oh, my goodness. Yeah. Okay. yeah. <laughs> yes. And uh, I was I really wondering uh, <laughs> about that. How did you notice? What was it like? Mm. Um, well, okay. Well, as we say in English, how long have you got? Because mm. it's a long story. <sighs> um... I'm trying to think of how best to present the story. Um, it was definitely linked to an abduction experience which I had in the Himalayas. And this is something that I don't often talk about. Mm. Um, I did actually mention it with our interview with Stephen Greer that is okay. going to be published in a few days' time. By the time this is out, people will have had a chance to see that. And just to give some context for that, the reason why I mentioned that to Stephen Greer on camera, and I took a deep breath and said, OK, I'll tell people about my own abduction experience, is because he was saying that, that most, if not all, of abductions were actually faked by the American military yeah. in some way. Now, this was in December 1981, and I was at 7,000 meters in the Himalayas in December, in winter, um, in northern Nepal, in a mountain, on a mountain called Makalu, mm -hmm. and a small British expedition, we were trying to climb it. We didn't actually do it, but we got quite high. And, uh, and I was abducted out of my tent in the middle of the night in December. Um, it's not a usual abduction when they come in, you know, to like an apartment in Amsterdam, which is all nice and easy. And, I don't know, think any abduction is listen, usual. No, but sure. But, <laughs> but this was quite unusual because, because I was floated out of my tent, um, uh, the temperature was probably, it was the middle of the night mm -hmm. in December in the Himalayas at 7,000 meters. The temperature must have been about minus 40 Celsius, oh, maybe colder. Oh. Um, uh, and when I recalled this happening, because mm -hmm. as with almost all abductions, you don't remember, what, mm -hmm. when I recalled it happening, the moment that I remember sitting in my tent, now I was lying in my tent mm -hmm. with three of us like sardines. There's my friend here and my friend here and I was like that and I was all zipped up in my sleeping bag. And then the zip of the tent opened and this little grey being poked his head through and looked at me, you know, like, like that. That was the single most frightening moment of my whole life when I remembered that moment. I nearly jumped right out of my chair and went through the ceiling when I remembered that. It's like, oh my God, you know. Mm -hmm. And then, I mean, it was real. You see, because you don't get shocked by an imaginary memory. Mm -hmm. You get shocked by a real memory. Yeah. And now, this is all very complicated because I don't believe that was a malicious uh, abduction. Mm -hmm. I believe that something was going on which was in some way a preparation for what we're doing now. Okay. Um, and it probably was all with my agreement at a higher level, because I'm very comfortable with what's happening now. At the time, I didn't understand the experience, but I wasn't... It's like, I don't know what's going on, what's going on, what's going on. But I wasn't... Um, it wasn't something that I wished hadn't happened. I just wanted to know why it was going on. Yeah. Now, oh, so very complicated. Um, at that time, one of the people I was with 
was a mountaineer friend of mine who, he was a small guy. He was, uh, I can only speak in terms of English feet. He was about five foot two. What's that, about one meter 60? Somebody, Something, tell me, yeah. something like that. Mm -hmm. He was quite a small guy. Um, uh, and um, he had had an ET experience at that time as well. In the same expedition, the previous day, he only told me about this years later, when he was going down the mountain from the same place, he fell into a crevasse, which is not a good idea if you're mm -hmm. a mountaineer on your own. Usually that's the end of the game, yeah. that's it. He fell into a crevasse, and the way that he told the story was, next thing I knew, I was out of the crevasse. He'd been teleported out of the crevasse, and there were two beings there who, who talked with him for a long time. And when he was telling me this story, I, I was becoming really freaked out because I knew that just the day after that, I had my abduction experience, mm -hmm. and we were comparing our experiences. Now, round about that time as well, I had a girlfriend who was also very small. She was even smaller. She was about one meter, one meter fifty. No, that can't be right. She was about four foot ten. What would that be? That's smaller. Anyone, no? I mean, one meter forty or something. That's pretty small. Yeah. That's pretty small. Yeah. Um, and uh, she had a lot of very interesting psychic power. She was a very unusual person. Um, and she would always tell me, and this always kind of slightly freaked me out, because I, I really enjoyed being with her. She said, you are very special. She said, we won't always be together, but I will always love you. Mm. And I, I mean, I don't know how to, you know, how on earth do you respond to something like that? You know? and, um, and she would, you know, she would know when things were going to happen, and she'd make the phone ring, and she'd be totally telepathic, and, and some, once or twice I'd be really upset, and she'd just look into my eyes, and then the upset would disappear. All this kind of weird stuff, but then humans can do that too. And one night, we were in bed, mm -hmm. just cuddling, cuddling in bed. It was about 11 o'clock at night, and she had her back to the door. Mm -hmm. And I was looking over her shoulder towards the door. And then this being appeared in the door. Okay. It wasn't like a classical grey being, but it looked like... It looked very much like what Arthur Newman describes mm -hmm. um, as a childlike being. Mm. Um, with quite big eyes, but not the kind of weird eyes. You know, kind of large eyes and, and quite a round head, but also quite small. Also unlike and the being you saw in your tent? And not like the being I saw in my tent. The being I saw in my tent was more of the classical grey. Okay. You see, okay. So I, and I saw this being in my room, sitting right there. And, and, sorry, standing right there in the doorway. And I froze and didn't say anything, because I couldn't believe what I was seeing. And, and Angie, which was her name, she had her back to the door. And I didn't say a word, and she said, don't worry, it's all right. Mm. I've seen them all my life, you've got nothing to be afraid of. And this being was behind her, and I hadn't said anything. And then, this whole thing completely freaked me out. And then I spoke to my other friend about this, Dave. Now, he was the mountaineer guy. And, um, and uh, he said... I know that that happened. Uh -huh. And I said, how do you know? Yeah. He said, I just know. You know. Hmm. And then that freaked me out even more. And then I went back to Angie, and I told her about what the conversation I'd had with Dave. And it was round about that time that he told me about the incident in the Himalayas. This is a very convoluted story. And Angie said, looking into... Da she said, I haven't talked with Dave about any of this but looking into Dave's head is like looking into my own, hmm. she said. And these two small beings with these strange abilities. And Angie would say things to me, um, like an example was what I, I, I um, mentioned before. She'd say, you're very special, 
you know, but I'll, and, and we won't always be together, but I'll always love you. And one day, we were sitting having breakfast, you know, just like with the croissants and the coffee and, you know, mm -hmm. and, 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 and she just looked at me and she said, the earth is a very beautiful place and it won't always be this way. And I've never forgotten those words. It sends a chill down my spine every time I think about it, yeah. you know. And, and I said, what did you say? What? What did you say? You know? And she just almost ignored the fact that she'd said it, and then she just carried on eating breakfast. And there were a number of other things which she said which I can't remember. Mm -hmm. But round about this time, I found myself thinking, this person is not a normal person. Absolutely not a normal person. No, something to say like and that. You there's have to something come from really, a place of knowing. Yeah, mm -hmm. there's something really strange going on here. And, I mean, I could spend two hours talking about all the mm -hmm. experiences I had here. But something which was really remarkable um, happened... Actually, there are two more parts of this story, because I don't want to take this story away from you, because <laughs> you've got a lot of stories of your own here. Um, <laughs> but but um, two things... Other things happened that are worth recording. Um, the second one of which, which I'll, I'll say at the end, I never tell anybody um, because it's so bizarre. Um, she attended a personal development workshop mm -hmm. um, where you get in touch with some of the, the thoughts and beliefs that you have that limit yourself and all of that kind of stuff. Um, and she, she was very small. She was the, 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 the eldest of three sisters, but she was the smallest. And she'd always make kind of jokes about herself. She said, you know, I'm not really small. People just think I'm small and, you know, and, and, and so on and so forth. And in this workshop, she realized that she had an investment in being small. In other words, mm -hmm. because she was small, she got to be the center of attention, she got to make jokes about herself, she got to, you know, there was a, it, it's what psychologists and therapists call a payoff. Mm -hmm. And when she realized that, she grew. And she, and she was 26 years old, and she grew, I've got to do the calculation again, she grew two and a half inches, which is about eight centimeters, in two weeks. Wow. And I have a feeling that it was actually overnight, but I can't prove that. It was definitely within two weeks. And what happened was like something out of a comedy film. I hadn't seen her for a little while because she'd been doing this workshop and stuff. And I went to give her a hug and I said, look, there's no need for you to stand on your toes. And she said, I'm not standing on your toes. You know, and I said, yes, you are because you're taller. And she said, I'm not taller. What do you mean? And she said, look, you're... and I looked and she was standing flat on her feet and she was taller. Um, and then we ran around the house seeing if she could fit into her clothes and if she could fit into her mm. shoes and, 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 and her shoes wouldn't fit. So she and wasn't was, aware of it herself? And No. Okay. For some reason she had no idea, mm -hmm. um, which is why I think this happened really suddenly. <laughs> I think that I have a feeling this happened really suddenly. Now this is biologically impossible, you know, but then you start high talking strangeness. with very, very high strangeness. Yeah. Um, uh, but she definitely grew. We measured her. It was midnight, and I went around phoning up all my friends, saying, "Angie's grown. Angie's grown." <laughs> and, they were, and they said, "What? What are you talking? What?" You know, <laughs> it was it was like something out of a out of a out of a out of a very very bad comedy movie. So that, <laughs> but that happened. She did grow. And I got really excited. I said, "Right, you're going to keep on growing, and you're going to be really tall." And but she freaked out about this whole thing because there's this human aspect of her, and then she stopped. All right. She she stopped growing. It's, it, it's remarkable, um, and that really happened. Um, and the other thing that happened was the culmination of what I had earlier described as she was saying, you know, um, we're not always going to be together, mm -hmm. and um, uh, but I'll always love you. And one day she just left. She said, "Okay, I'm going now." She said, my purpose in your life is complete. And that's enough to freak you out when, you've, when, you, when you really love someone. You spent yeah. three years with them. She said, my purpose in your life is complete. Now I'm going. You know, I'll yes. always love you. Bye-bye. And I said, well, what's the problem? She said, there's no problem. She said, my purpose in your life is complete. This is why I think this whole thing, whatever it was, connected with this abduction experience and my other friend Dave, it was some kind of a setup oh. for this. And I was hugely upset by this, as you might imagine. I, yeah. I couldn't 
cope with this no, at all. I, I had reckon. no way of coping with this. Yeah. And it was Christmas time. We'd bought tickets for a skiing holiday. And it's like, well, what about my skiing holiday? And she said, well, just give the ticket to someone else. You know, it's okay. And I had some people staying in my house, and I was so upset, I stayed in bed for three days. I couldn't handle it. I went into a personal black hole. Mm -hmm. th th this was all back in, this was 20 years ago. This was in 1986. Mm. Um, and on the third day, and this is what I don't tell anyone, it's, it's the most extraordinary story. On the third day, another being appeared in my room, like the first one. Mm -hmm. And you know that story, uh, that, 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 um, uh, the, the, the scene in E.T., the movie E.T., mm -hmm. you know, when he has his glowing red finger and he heals Elliot, because Elliot is mm -hmm. upset, you know, the little boy who he, who he befriends. This is what happened to me. This, this being appeared in my room, and I've been sitting there in bed, unable to move, unable to function, couldn't handle this. This was not intended. The being came up to me with his finger, touched me in the middle of the chest, and then I was fine. All the upset went away, and I went downstairs, and the whole thing was handled for me. Wow. It was a remarkable story. Yeah. I don't tell people that, because there's no way anyone can believe it. Um, I don't believe it myself, you know, but that's what happened. Um, and it's a very important story for one reason, that despite its unbelievability, what it shows me is that these beings who were behind that abduction and that experience and that program, whatever it was, they actually have compassion. They really do have compassion. Yeah. This, wasn't a bio this wasn't a mindless program biological robot. Mm -hmm. This was somebody who came in, because it wasn't part of the plan that I should be so upset that I couldn't function. So they had to fix that and they fixed it, and it was a compassionate act. Um, and you could really feel it like that? It just disappeared. Yeah. It just, everything disappeared. Like somebody had turned a switch and I wasn't upset anymore. Um, I, wasn't, I wasn't upset because something was added on, like a mask. The upset was handled because they took the upset away, which is the basis of, of um, all effective therapeutic programs is the mm -hmm. charge that's associated with an incident, you remove that charge and then you're back to normal again. Wow. It's the charge that makes people upset, so they lifted the charge off and then it had gone. And, uh, and I haven't had, uh, I, I, I've, I suppose I've had a few strange experiences since then, but I haven't had anything like that. Mm -hmm. Every now and then I kind of hope they might come back and say, hey guys, you're doing a great job. <laughs> you know, nothing. Yeah. Nothing and you never nature. saw her again either? I never saw her again. Okay. Never saw her again. Extraordinary story. It's, it, it, it's a remarkable story. Yeah. Um, but one of the reasons why I don't tell it, well actually, actually there are three reasons why I don't tell it. One is a standard reason why, why anyone who's had a strange experience, they usually don't tell their story because people start looking at them a little bit, mm -hmm. a little bit weird. You yeah. know. Another thing is because it's so complicated that it's hard to explain. Um, and the third reason, and all of these things are reasons which I hold at the same time, the third reason is that other people have experiences that actually, I believe, are far more significant. Um, we interviewed Jim Sparks, you know, and God alone can understand what kind of experience he's been through. Yeah. And last night we were talking to somebody whose whole life has been about this, you know, over and over and over again. And, and I also don't want to be sort of attracting attention to myself as some special case here, because I don't think, I don't think this is a, spe it's a weird story, but it's not a special case. And, you know, I've sort of integrated it into my life. And the way I've integrated it into my life is by saying, you know what, I'm not even going to try and understand that, but it's got something to do with what I'm doing now. And what I'm doing now is important, and who I am now is important. And this kind of goes right back to where we are now uh, and the subject of this conversation uh, uh, and this is where I want to stop monopolizing the conversation to bring Kerry into it because we have had the feeling over and over again ever since we started that we have been helped we've been guided we've had doors open for us we've been assisted by hidden hands um, we don't know whether they're ET whether they're angelic whatever on earth is going on but 
there's no reasonable way that we could have done what we've done without some kind of a no. some kind of help and the metaphor which I often use is walking towards a blank wall and then the door suddenly opens and you go through into another room mm. and you can't see the door until you get there and then it suddenly magically appears and that's been the experience we've had ever since the beginning and now I'm going to stop talking okay well the energetics <laughs> around you too yeah. is is uh, it's very clear that this mm. happens that that you must have in whatever way mm. Uh, have some help. Yeah. yeah, but we're not the only ones. This is the important no, thing. True. We're not trying to be special, no. and I'm not trying to be special. <clears throat> we I experienced talk, it myself. Yeah, yeah. sure. Um, everyone in this room, probably, yeah. um, has had experiences that they find hard to explain, and some people have really weird experiences, and they don't even talk about them at yeah. all, but the number of human beings who have had remarkable, transformative experiences is much larger than anyone would think. I'm quite sure of it. Yeah. That's my well, very long elevator sharing. speech. Yeah. See what and happens when you ask me a simple question? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a real danger. Yeah, it's true. talk for an hour. Yeah. Um, maybe in the same radio interview, I heard you also say that you had a, a UFO experience when you were young. And uh, I wondered about that. How, how, how was it? Uh, what, did you feel it had any significance of... Uh, um, well, I, I have to say that my experience is a little different than Bill's in the sense that um, since I was young, I had, um, I guess, uh, I think I had a repetitious experience uh, going on all the time okay. when I was young. Um, and I had a recurring nightmare. In, in that, I was, um, uh, I would go to sleep and then I would be walking down a path out of my front door and it was a little path uh, and there was a picket fence and I didn't live in a house that had a path and a picket fence okay, okay? <laughs> but this is what I would dream mm -hmm. and at the end of the picket fence um, there would be a man standing there with a, I know this sounds a fedora you know one of those hats from okay. you know like like a, a, a spy movie and a, a big and an overcoat Okay, a, like a Zorro and, or something. Um, and I thought, uh, and I was afraid, and I would hear a sort of a, a, a buzzing sound, and then, you know, I would wake up, and I would be terrified. And that was recurring all the time. Um, at the same time, strangely enough, not so long ago, I saw a video of myself with my family. When I was, I must have been, I don't know, 16 or something like that. And um, and I just look different than everyone else. I, I don't know how to explain it. Mm -hmm. And my sister, I can tell you that this is so strange, that my sister actually turned to me and looked at the video and said, who is that? <laughs> 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 and I turned to her and I said, it's me. And she's like, like she didn't remember me from then or something like that. Uh, you know, I was it was just, just a weird, sort yeah. of a strange thing. And... Um, and I looked at myself, and I've seen, this has happened to me before. It happened to me when I was in school. I was videotaped for a, I was doing a speech or something. And I was, I didn't know who that was <laughs> when I looked at the thing. I couldn't, I don't know how to explain that, but it was a strange thing that would happen to me. I would, and I was filmed when I was a kid, you know, they were shooting movies around the school or something, just kids' things. But, um... So anyway, the uh, the thing with um, beyond that, as I was reading books on magic and um, and things, and I, <laughs> when I was like eleven, mm -hmm. I was very. Um, I learned. I taught myself to read when I was, you know, very very young, before I could go to school. My brother okay. was going to school, and I I would sit at the door and wait for him to come home so I could ask him a word, and um, so I was very. Um, I don't know whatever precocious you might say mm -hmm. like I, I wouldn't say you know that I was you know extraordinarily brilliant or some kind of thing like that but I was you know I was very aware I guess I was fully aware when I was a kid like I was very upset that I was a kid because I couldn't go out and just run my life mm -hmm. and I didn't understand why you know why I was put into this body and this thing that I was little and a child because in my head I wasn't that person you know I was yeah. in another place so um, but besides that I also had um, I guess you know uh, awareness of beings being around 
okay. all the time. So, um, but if, certainly if I saw UFOs you. later. Okay. Um, when we were older, I you know I just knew about them. In fact, I had mm. some friends even. I went to New York and I studied acting, and a couple of friends t said to me one day, they said, um, well, you're really like an E.T. <laughs> they, we were just walking down the street, and we, I wasn't in Camelot, and I wasn't associated with UFOs, and I wasn't studying them or any of that stuff, and we were involved in music and art and things, and they just turned to me and said, well, you know, we, you're just like an E.T. or something, and yeah. I was like, I was hurt by that <laughs> yeah, I, <reckon. laughs> I thought, oh my god you know what is it i'm doing and saying that's so odd that these people are like that and mm -hmm. and saying that about me but um then i also i also knew exactly what i was doing um i i um i knew about eastern philosophy and i i was tested in college and in a class and by a a, a person who was from india and he, you know, I wrote some kind of essay, and he read it to the class, and he said, well, you know all about this stuff. And I had never read a book about it at all. Mm -hmm. um, so, but anyway, I, I decided that I would reach enlightenment. <laughs> just, it was my deci decision when I was, like, 21 or something. I, I, I was just going to do this. Mm -hmm. So I just um, got some books on Kundalini and so on. And then I sat and meditated. And I ended up meditating every day for um, like hours and hours for um, probably, probably a, a month or so. I stopped kind of going to work <laughs> and everything else. Mm -hmm. And I, I did. I reached um, Kundalini, you know, a Samadhi, what's called a Samadhi experience and um, merged with everything. And so I did all this mm -hmm. very consciously. Like I knew I was going to do it. I planned it and I did it, you know. Um, so I have to say that I've had, it, I would classify it more spiritual experiences. Mm -hmm. Like I came at the UFO thing from a more spiritual place. Yeah. Um, but, um, you know, I, we were, my family was camping in Lake Tahoe and it was 4th of July or something like that. And we were just having a camping trip and sleeping under the stars. And I was, um, I don't know how old I was, like maybe in my 20s or, or maybe 30s at that point. And up on the, in the sky were all these, well, they, were, they looked like stars, mm -hmm. but then they just started moving around. And they were all moving. And there was, I mean, it just went on for hours. And we were just watching it. And I said, look at all the UFOs. You know, so I was the only one in my family who knew anything about that. And I directed their attention to that. And then we just watched it. And we, it was like they were having a party, basically, in space because all these all the stars were not just sitting there. They were just like all moving around and going places and zipping back and forth. It was like they were having a huge meeting. For everyone to see. Well, my it, family. Yeah, yeah, like okay. But it was not just stars. you who saw it. Yeah. yeah. It was a display. Yeah, it wow. was just it's going on and on. But it was, yeah. they were way far up there. So okay. they looked like stars. Yeah. But they literally were zipping around. All right. And, um, and so that was fine. You know, that was just like normal or nothing, you know, nothing... It just seemed normal, yeah, yeah. you know, it didn't For seem you. like a big deal. It wasn't like... To you, but to your family, it was extraordinary, I reckon. Um, well, they didn't get all excited really? or anything. I mean, we were laughing about it, just laying in our sleeping bags, kind of laughing about it and stuff. And um, then, uh, you know, but, but they don't consciously seem to recognize, you know, think about this kind of thing, mm -hmm. that I'm involved in Cam Camelot and all that. They don't even know. I mean, they know, you know, I've said, go to my website, mm. blah, 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 but they don't go, you know, okay. they, they don't, one sister isn't online at all, and she's the one that would be, I mean, she's open to things, she's fairly psychically aware. Mm -hmm. My other sister has had, I think, experiences, I mean, I think, you know how they say these abductions, whatever, run in families, I do believe we have had that in my okay. family. Yeah. Um, my mother was quite interesting, you know, she she was very aware and and open to mm -hmm. all sorts of spiritual things and um, you know but at the same time you know she also was very conventional in certain ways mm -hmm. you know but um, so to answer your question um, I, I haven't had any um, other than I see light beings all the time I actually saw a couple yeah, last night not last night but the night before before we d went on stage they come two of them came uh, they visit me for a while and then they disappear. And I've seen them since I was in my twenties. All right. And they've accompanied me 
um, to places. And whenever I would be in a state where I'd be very upset, because I had a, you know, I, I, I was a sort of struggling actor and lived in, in New York City and studied acting and I didn't have any money and I didn't even always know if I could eat that day and I hated borrowing money from my parents so I wouldn't tell them and so on and so forth. So I had some rough times mm -hmm. and they were always, they would come and visit me. Okay, so your initial experience in your dreams were very frightening, actually. And that, they, uh, that one, yeah, when I was a little, really little kid, um, and I was afraid of Santa Claus. I know this sounds <laughs> stupid, but when Christmas would come and people, would, you know, this is when when we were really young, and I, um, they would say, oh well, Santa Claus is going to come, and Santa Claus came, you know, supposedly and flew mm -hmm. in the sky, right? Oh, right. And okay. so um, I. <laughs> I just remember thinking to myself, oh, well, if Santa Claus, you know, if there is such a being as Santa Claus, I'm not interested in looking out the window or letting them know that I'm awake because right. they're going to, you know, because mm -hmm. they're going to do something. I was, yeah, I was yeah, afraid so. of something. But your overall yeah. feeling um, I mean, after all those years, uh, is, is it, uh, would you label it as more positive or more, more negative? Um, well, I'm not convinced of what was going on that. I'm not, there's, some, there's some other things that I've just put together recently which have to do with um, you know, my labs, which is uh, when... Um, Military abductions. Yeah, yeah, my whole family, mm -hmm. all the kids in my family, there's four of us, were born in a certain hospital, except for me. And I was born in a military hospital at, in Palo Alto near Moffett Field which is a, a military base. Mm -hmm. um, and I never, I always thought, well, I'm, I'm, you know, special. I was born in a special hospital, you know, different than everyone. But I never put two and two together. And just recently I've been thinking, well, isn't mm -hmm. that interesting? My father was a pilot in World War II. He built his own airplane. Um, he was, you know, quite br brilliant in his way. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and I don't know what that's about. And I'm sure my mother would have no idea. She would say, oh, it's ridiculous. Nothing went on. But it was just like a weird little thing that went on there. And so if you put that together with the guy with the overcoat and the buzzing and the whatever, I, maybe there was something that went on early on. Hmm. Okay. But who knows? Yeah. And maybe we can never know these things. No. It, 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 well, you can, I, it, yeah, maybe you, you have a, an overall feeling if it's more... Mm right or if it's more something mm. you don't want I, I, I yeah I think I mean I don't think now when I look back mm -hmm, at it mm -hmm. I, I'm sure that um, that this is probably an overall positive thing oh. that I was very involved in mm -hmm. but at the same time I'm also you know I'm aware that there are positive and negative beings like mm -hmm. I have no doubt in my mind whatsoever and it could yeah. could be that this comes from my own past mm -hmm. of having been exposed to them um, on different levels, you know. Yeah. Um, and I, and I I'm psychically aware of a lot of things going on. Mm -hmm. You know, I see things. Uh, pretty much have kept it to myself, okay. even now in Camelot. Yeah. You know, Once this isn't the kind of thing that we talk things. about, even to each other, mm -hmm. because our our um, focus is 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 external to ourselves yeah. and it's yeah. on other people. Yeah. It's not meant to be about us. No. You know. yeah. so that's, uh, but it guides us, yeah. I have to yeah. say. I mean, I will tell Bill things, you know, yeah. that we, we need to do or this or that and because I'm getting a direct, very strong message and he gets this occasionally as well. Okay. Um, mm. And I think that in many ways, I mean, I think we are protected on an earthly level, but I think we're very protected on an unseen level. Yeah. Um, I so think one of the things uh, that unites yeah. us, mm -hmm. um, which I've only recently really realized is unusual, is that we have no fear none, at all. None. Absolutely none. That's um, quite extraordinary. Absolutely none. Yeah. And, and, and um, it's so, I mean, the idea of us having fear is so unusual that we don't even think about the fact that we don't have fear. We just do our thing, you know. Um, and it's other people who point yeah, out, well, I have aren't you afraid? Yeah, I trouble understanding you know. to mm. some degree, some people. And that isn't because I'm not afraid of anything. I mean, you know, I've had times in my life where, you know, I've been alone and, you know, sort of a desperate situation, whatever. Um, I mean, that's like when that I spider appeared. I moved to New York in. City from, from California. Stop it. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. I moved to New York City. Spiders are a big problem. I don't, oh, yeah, okay. I don't like spiders. Um, <laughs> 
But I moved to New York City when I was a kid, you know, like um, in my young, I don't know, I was around in my late 20s uh, to study acting. Mm -hmm. And coming from Northern California, if you know anything about that, um, you know, I grew up in Northern California, and that's a certain kind of a person, you know, like Northern California, we have sort of a thing about that, you know. We're I like know. cool, we're very advanced, okay. you know, so that's why, you know, the 60s happened, it yeah. really happened in San Francisco, and Apple you know, computer so whole, and the whole thing. Oh, yeah, right. and okay. I grew up mm. near Apple computer and all that. So, um, the fancy when I part moved, of the world. <laughs> well, I don't know, but when I moved to New York, mm -hmm. um, the you know it was complete drastic difference to hit the streets and have zillions of people you know everywhere and um, you know also to ha to go in the subway and stuff and it was very intimidating for a, a young mm. sort of blondish mm. person uh, female especially and mm. um, so in that sense I knew fear you know I'm, yeah, so okay. I'm saying but um, in terms of Camelot it's just not even a second thought I don't know why I just know that we in other words, and and I will do and say just about anything. I mean, we've been told, like I was just told a number of times recently that I'd be killed if I said certain things. And I've said them. Not, I didn't, you know, we're not stupid, mm -hmm. I, I have to say. But on the same, by the same token, it's like, you know. Yeah, but you, you get a lot of um, requests, I think, from whistleblowers to get on. And you determine which one you give stage and which you don't. And uh, it's probably all intuitive uh, because no story is actually verifiable. Ex uh, yeah, well, we more or less. Mm -hmm. And, and, and mm -hmm. you have to make constantly choices. Do we give stage or don't we? And, That's right. Um, do you decline a lot? Do you, do, do you get a lot of requests? Uh, I'm a whistleblower and uh, I have a story. And, uh, <laughs> we, get, we get a lot of people writing mm. to us saying, I'm the most important person in the world. I have the special ET experience. And it's it's I'm sorry, but it's it's very common. I mean, we get zillions of emails of this type. And I mean, just recently I was just looking in my inbox. We've got but, two people writing to yeah. us saying, "I'm, you know, I want you to interview me. I've got this most important story and it's just your typical, you know, yeah. abduction mm -hmm. experience." No. Mm -hmm. okay. This needs a caveat because we're not trying to minimize or marginalize anyone who's had a very important personal experience. What Kerry's really talking about, I think, is context. And some people, yeah. Yeah. for understandable reasons, they have trouble integrating their own experience. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but it some is important to say that, you know, that this is worldwide, you know, and yeah. what happens is, you know, everyone has a special thing because it seems special to them. But we actually get you know, I have to say, we do get people writing to us saying, I've got the message for the, the, the planet. This is really what they say and mm -hmm. what they think. Mm. They think they are the one. And this is, this is a pitfall in this world that we're in. Yeah. And one of mm. the, the bell ringers for us in evaluating whether or not to talk to a person is how, what happens is a real whistleblower comes across very subtly very buttoned up. Very they, low key. They rarely tell us everything in the first email. Mm -hmm. They they write to us and they say, um, you know, I have a couple things to talk to you about. Um, I wonder if you know. I mean, sometimes it's a one liner. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they'll they'll put in one word that that might be like a covert way to see if we're awake and aware and and whether we we pick up on it. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's a fascinating process, yep. what goes on mm -hmm. uh, in, in terms of people communicating to us. The other part of that is that, in a sense, we're not really a website for, whistle, for, for um, abduct, abductees no, or no, contactees. No. No. That's actually not our, our area no. of expertise or the area that we've decided to focus on. Okay. We really have decided to focus on you know, um, whistleblowers that come out of the, the sort of black projects. But on the other hand, um, what has happened is that some of our, our research researchers, some of our, the people that we have been attracted to interview, for an intuitive reason, have had ET you know, experiences yeah, yeah, and yeah. contact and channeling and so on. Yeah. Oh, I it's really like the, uh, the broadness of the, the, mm -hmm. the spectrum you mm -hmm. cover in, uh, in your interviews.
who we don't have a strategy or a plan. You see, these things come at us yeah. in a very holistic, integrated way. Yeah. Things just things just happen, mm -hmm. almost like there's some kind of a script script being written mm -hmm. um, in some you know in an esoteric sense. And 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 what we do is we just go with the flow. And, we, and if we both feel intuitively, this is exactly what Kerry said. You know, and we get a message. Sometimes, because we both get all of our mail, mm -hmm. um, we both home in on the same message and saying, this message here, have you read that? And she said, yeah, I've just read that this moment. Th this person mm -hmm. feels important, and al almost mm -hmm. invariably that's significant. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, but I, I, I term it as, in a sense, we are following the trail of a mystery. And yeah. we, are, we are going where the trail and the clues lead us. Mm -hmm. And that means that even right now, we cannot tell you, we're not going to rule somebody out because you say, oh, you know, this person's in the health field or this person's in the such and such field. We actually, there is no area that we no. won't go in, it, but it on, only depends on if we get the push the, the, to follow the clue yeah. and to go in that direction. So logically, like there's some people who collect all the interviews with everyone who's ever talked about such and such, right? Mm -hmm. And ever written a book about such and such. We don't actually do that. We don't duplicate. What we're doing is actually following a trail. So if we get one person in a certain area, but that one person is very well chosen, at least from our point of view. Yeah, okay? it's, it's, and you can feel it. I mean, it's, it's to, to follow your, you and your work is uh, it's quite extraordinary, actually. <laughs> yeah, it's... it's, uh, it's it, but I, I really like to encourage you to... Uh, That's, we want yeah. to paint the big mm. picture. So yeah. each is a piece of the puzzle. Mm. Yeah. They're not duplicate pieces. Yeah. And I also like that you uh, don't have the same opinion always. Never. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, we, it's funny because we will agree on intuitive sort of <laughs> messages, but sometimes, but in terms of overall approach, it's drastically different. Mm -hmm. He's he's more the scientific. Um, we say Mulder and Scully from you know X Files. Only he's Scully and I'm Mulder. Yeah. Because he's the scientist and I'm more the intuitive, um, you know, communicator. And on the money thing, how does money work for you? And because I, I, a couple of months ago, a couple of weeks ago, I read on your blog, well, money is a problem, mm. and um, everybody has to make a living. And mm. here we have two beautiful people doing most extraordinary work for uh, and waking up the planet to a certain story. And um, what is your view on that? Why do you... Why does everything at the core of your work has to be free? I mean, there must be, must be some way to somehow support you more by the people that watch your videos. I mean, I think I might imagine that you could do better and more if you had more, uh, less worry about money in a, a way. Mm -hmm. I, Let me I, answer this for first. There are different right. ways to go at this, and mm -hmm. it's an interesting question. For me, it's it's about a, a a philosophical reversal of the principle of money, which is based on exchange. Mm -hmm. you know, if I've got a cup of co if I've got a coffee shop, I give you the cup of coffee, and then you give me three euros or three dollars or whatever it is, and that's the exchange. Yeah. But I say to you. I'm not, I've got the cup of coffee here. I'm not going to give it to you unless you give me the money first. That's how it works. Mm -hmm. a, I mean, or, you know, unless you agree to give me the money first. Yeah. It's yeah. like so. And then, and then it's changed. Now, usually that's the way business is, um, is done. And the way that things are sold on the Internet, often it's like you've got a DVD or you've got a video or you've got a book. And it's like, okay, you give me the money, then I'll send you the information. Yeah. Okay. Now, what we've done is we put it in reverse. It's like, we'll give you all the information, and we trust that it's going to come back to us. Mm -hmm. And maybe I'll give you the information, and he gives me the money. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter who gives us the money, mm -hmm. okay. you see. Because it's the principle of flow. Yeah, yeah. The principle is that we give people whatever we have, and then if the universe is playing fair, yeah. and it seems to be, then you we may, get a return. And we you, may get remi you may remind mm. people more of doing that. Because, mm. for example, if I, if I look at myself, I made like four or five times a small donation, and I expect mm. uh, eh, maybe everybody does mm. that, but apparently mm. it doesn't happen. And uh, if I was reminded 
more often uh, in a video at the end of a video, mm. for example, mm. uh, yeah. to, to make a donation, ah. then uh, I probably would have done it more often. Yeah, our cameraman um, but, is, yeah. Is, is very pleased but, that you just said that because he's. This is his advice to us. And it was his idea, yeah. so it yeah. was his idea. Yeah, thank That's you why I'm bringing much. it up. But for me, there's a point here as well. You see that it's a little bit. Um, it's like that also becomes part of the process that we don't think about. It's mm -hmm. just like okay, this is. This is like an article of trust. We just trust it's going to work that yeah, way, yeah, yeah. and then it does. Yeah. And and. Um, the philosophical backdrop for wanting to do it that way is because the information is not ours to sell. No, it's, it's not ours. No. You can't have copyright on this stuff. No. People who think, well, I own this information and I own the words in this interview and I own you know, my experience and you can't have it. This is very, very small, limited human thinking, which is a very old paradigm. Yeah. We're only acting as a channel for yeah. this information, as a way of getting this information out. It's not ours. So how no. can we sell something that doesn't belong to us? Well, you, maybe you shouldn't think um, about that. I thought well, about I, something yesterday, I, okay. and uh, I want to uh, bring that into the world um, at, with this interview. Maybe um, I thought it, would, it maybe would be nice to make a kind of um, a tribute to uh, Bill and Kerry from uh, all kinds of whistleblowers they had, all kinds of uh, people uh, that watch your videos and um, in Holland we do that a lot that uh, with uh, let's say um, uh, like for example the tsunami hit here and we are 16 million people and there was one TV show and we raised about a hundred million uh, euros for that mm -hmm. and um, Maybe, maybe that's an idea. Maybe that's maybe someone will pick it up. Maybe mm. not. Uh, that's just an idea I had. Thank you. Um, yeah. Um, well, I have to say that our philosophy on this mm -hmm. is a little bit different. Um, we're both aligned in the sense that this material needs to be free at the outset. Mm -hmm. um, it. What it's about is that what we, you know, we talked about it yesterday. What, which is the idea of people not having access, whether mm -hmm. it's to information or truth or mm -hmm. secrets. And so the last thing we want to do is, is put a barrier there yeah. between the people and the truth mm -hmm. that we want to get out there. So we want that to get out there and thank God for the internet because it is there, it, it is a medium that allows us to yeah. do that. So we were completely in agreement from, the, from day one, everything was going to be free. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's beautiful. Um, and, and, and that has to happen. In fact, we've been offered it to do a television show, you know, like on regular TV. Okay. Um, although it didn't actually happen, you know, this was a year ago. And um, even then, we were saying but to the producers, but you do understand that our videos are going to be free on Camelot. I mean, it has to be that way. Now, on the other hand, we are, at least I am more practical because I'm a filmmaker in the sense that if we, what we don't do is package DVDs and what we need to do is do that because, and those would go for sale because there okay. is a labor and a cost yeah. to actually yeah. produce mm. that. Now there's a labor and a cost to produce what we do. Definitely. Um, but we are kind of, like I said, guerrilla filmmakers and we, you know, and, and we are going on the paradigm that if we put it out mm. there it will come back. I and mean, we do believe that and it has yeah. worked. Um, although I have to say for the first two years um, I had a small inheritance from my mother passing and we financed, were self-financed and then the last year Bill's mother passed and, sh and we had a small amount of money from there that kept us going and then we also started asking for donations I think it was a little about a year now it's been almost a year and a half ago um, and our Avalon site we started charging um, yeah for subscriptions a dollar <laughs> or whatever you want or five dollars a month but um, that hasn't actually been all that successful people didn't want to pay so much for you know being on a forum and so on um, but we tried to convey to them that the that what that subscription was going to do was go into the Camelot work that that you know sort of the information sort of fuels everything else mm -hmm. right because yeah. anybody we interview is going to help mm raise the level of consciousness and and also for the Avalon side of things which is the side which has to do with finding safe places preparing for the future in, in sort of a nuts and bolts way yeah um, and and we do have another site that that we're looking to do which is is called project light warrior and we you are going that to, on the radio. to help people yeah. 
develop themselves because beyond developing your own safe place and getting into groups and networking there's a side that is more spiritual about preparing for the days to come on you know that you need to become as enlightened as you you can be yeah. and become as much of a spiritual warrior as possible and there we got yes. Yoda on the wall there exactly to remind because us of we <laughs> are, uh, because we yeah. are going to face mm -hmm. what what we're facing is much more of a spiritual experience it will manifest physically uh -huh. here and you know on the material realm on the thir 3d but but the real sort of nuts and bolts um, battle if you will will happen for the hearts and minds of humanity mm -hmm. And, yeah. and so that is what we want to help in the future to equip people along those lines. So there is a spiritual war going on. It's just that right here and now on this planet, there seems to be one of the front lines. Yeah. Um, that's one way to put it. So, I mean, but, so you can't put a price on that. You can't say, 